I'm Donna Strawhorn. I'm Neil. Welcome to worship. of the coming Christ, we light the second candle of our Advent wreath. For us, a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to law and yet did not want to expose her to public grace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Today, like Mary, we wait for the Christ child. We celebrate all that God has already done and say, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. We reflect on the wonder of the precious name of Jesus, our Savior and Prince of Peace. Today, focus on the peace that comes from knowing that Jesus is the God who saves. Prince of Peace, help us to remember that you have come to save us and fill us with your peace as we trust in your name that is above every other name. Amen. Good morning, friends. Welcome to worship. As we begin our second Sunday in Advent, our second Sunday in our new sermon series, The Wonder of Christmas, we gather this morning to wonder at a name. And so as we begin worship this morning, would you join me as uh, we turn to the opening prayer? Dear Lord, we come to wonder at the name that you were given. Our Heavenly Father gave you a name that is above every other name. What a joy it is to speak your name, to say your name out loud, Jesus. Jody Picoult, author of Handle with Care, once said, when you love someone, you say their name different, like it's safe inside your mouth. Lord, we love you. And we do say your name differently than the world. We say your name, Jesus, with reverence and wonder and joy. Draw near to us this morning, Lord, and bless our time of worship. Give us hearts to worship you, to come with wonder in our hearts. And we, we lift you up. We honor you and celebrate your coming, your birth, your name. You came to save us from our sins. And we are saved. In your precious name, we pray. Amen. And now we turn to one of my favorite hymns, written in 1719 by Isaac Watts, a Methodist pastor. Oh, let us worship the living God.
Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive the King. Let every heart prepare in room. And heaven and nature sing, let heaven and nature sing. Let us pray the prayer that our Lord taught his disciples to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The haunting melody of our next hymn has its roots as far back as the 15th century, but it wasn't until 1960 that a musicologist found the manuscript and the tunes building blocks for our next hymn this morning.
name is Renee and I'm from the Ad Council. Because of your generosity and your giving, we are able to make a donation of $125 to Someplace Safe as one of our missions of the month. Thank you for your generosity and Merry Christmas. Dear Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to give you our tithes and offerings. We pray that what we bring to you this morning would give you joy, it would please you. And we pray, Lord God, that you would take our offering and you would multiply it and apply it in, in, in ways by your spirit that inspire wonder in people's hearts. People that maybe haven't even come to know you yet. They may not know the true meaning of Christmas. We pray that you would take our offering and use it to expand your kingdom on this earth. Amen. the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and she will name him Emmanuel. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and was pondering what kind of greeting this was. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and give birth to a son. You shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. She will give birth to a son, and you shall name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Emmanuel, God with us, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father. Prince of Peace and Son of the Most High. You have so many names, Lord, but let us also call you Jesus, meaning God saves or the Lord is salvation, because you came to save us from our sins. You came to be our Savior, and for all who receive you can know this salvation. Oh, the wonder of your name. Oh, the wonder of your name that is above every other name. Jesus, we come this morning to worship you. Open our hearts, open our eyes and our understanding to how amazing your name is. Amen. Christmas is a time full of family traditions. In our, in our household, we always had our stockings hanging from the fireplace mantle. We had uh, Christmas cookies, thin sugar cookies with red sprinkles on top. And then we always watched Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, uh, Frosty the Snowman, uh, a Charlie Brown, Charlie Brown Christmas. Uh, but after I came to faith in Christ and Christmas Christmas started to take on a whole different meaning, meaning for me, uh, beyond just getting 
<laughs> getting the presents. Love that part. But so then I, to the point where I had to add another tradition. And I, I, I find a quiet moment uh, and I grab my Bible and I read the Christmas story out of Luke chapter 2 out loud to myself. And usually Keegan shows up and then uh, we read it by uh, candlelight, the, the, I mean the Christmas tree lights. And it's kind of a sacred moment. It's just a little thing that I've added. And... You know, if, and before we get further into the, the sermon this morning, if you're looking for a really good Advent resource, uh, I would still like to recommend and will continue to recommend that you look into uh, the wonder of Christmas. I'm leaning on that resource heavily this morning, and it, uh, this chapter this week is writ written by Ed Robb, and I just really appreciate his work. So maybe you have that same tradition. Maybe you gather as a family and you too read the Christmas story out loud together. But did you know that the Christmas story is only in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke? Mark's Gospel opens not at an inn in Bethlehem, but in the River Jordan as at Jesus' baptism. Mark's style is vigorous and direct, emphasizing what Jesus did. Likewise with John, John leaves out the Christmas story and begins with a strong dose of theology. He goes back not to the mystery of a young peasant girl receiving the Christ child, but to the mystery of the Godhead before time began, emphasizing that Jesus, the word of God, has always existed. We wouldn't say that Mark and John, uh, their gospels, that they contradict Matthew and Luke. They, we would just say they emphasize different things. And with Matthew and Luke, we, we wouldn't say that they contradict each other. Again, they just emphasize different things as they record their own unique pers perspectives on the Christmas story as they cover the birth of Jesus. For instance, Matthew's account emphasizes Matthew's Jewish heritage and pride in his country. He includes a list of Jesus' ancestors back only as far as it goes to like Abraham, the father of the Jews. Matthew demonstrate, demonstrates how Christ, the coming of this baby boy, is the coming of the long-awaited Messiah. And he is the one to redeem captive Israel. He shows how all the evidence adds up and how all the prophecies are indeed fulfilled in Jesus. But Luke's gospel account is different. Luke is a Gentile, the only Gentile writer of the gospels, and it shows where Matthew's version tells the story of Jesus' birth from Joseph's perspective, Luke shares Jesus' birth from Mary's perspective. And he traces Jesus' lineage all the way back to Adam. Luke stresses how Jesus is for all people, not just the Jews. Luke shares story after story of how Jesus interacted with the poor and the downtrodden, and how Jesus even interacted with women. So it should not surprise us that Luke shares so many experiences in his gospel from women. He shares Mary's experience and Elizabeth's experience and the story of Anna in the temple and the woman who anointed Jesus' feet and then um, wiped his feet dry with her hair. Luke wants his readers to know that G this Jesus is for everyone and therefore emphasizes his lowly birth, lying in a lowly manger, and how the lowly shepherds came to worship him. Jesus is approachable. This Jesus is approachable and relatable because he too came from humble beginnings. We have to remember that 
the Jewish culture of the time was male oriented. It was a male oriented society and they didn't value women. Every day in their morning prayers, Jewish men would thank God for not making them a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. And did you notice the order? Being born a Gentile would be better than being born a slave. And if one had to be born a slave, at least that was better than being born a woman. Ouch. <laughs> Even though Matthew and Luke emphasize different things in the birth of the Christ child, they do converge on one important point. There is one important detail they both include. The name that the child is to be given. And that is an important point of agreement. Naming children is important. I, my mom uh, thought long and hard about how, wh what name she was going to give her children. Every year she told me the story uh, again of how my brother Mark was named after, after the rifleman's son, Mark McCain. She liked the boy in the show, and so that's how Mark got his name. And every year she would tell me about my name. I was supposed to be a Karen when I was born, but when she took one look at me, apparently she decided, you don't look like a Karen. And she changed uh, her mind and, and called me Amy, which I love my name. I love my name. Names held, held great meaning for the Hebrews. A person's name carried tremendous, um, a tremendous amount of significant, significance. What's unique, but what's unique about the Hebrew culture is that people's names were often changed. We see how in the Old Testament a person's name could change to signify some new meaning. When God gave someone a new name, it was because a divine purpose was revealed to and placed inside that person. Names communicate identity in the Bible. So a changed name signifies that, that God had transformed that person, that person's identity, and rerouted the trajectory of their life. God changed Abram's name to Abraham. It was a sign of his promise to Abraham that he would become the father of many nations. Jesus changed Simon's name to Peter, which means rock, and communicated in that he was going to build his church on this rock, on this person, to establish, to establish his church. Jacob, in the Old Testament, wrestled with God all night long. And in the morning, God gave Jacob a new name, calling him Israel, meaning he, he struggles with God. And the nation of Israel has certainly lived into that meaning ever since. So when we come to the name that Mary and, and Joseph, you know, the name that was given to their child, was there special meaning to his name? Jesus in the Greek, in the Greek form, is the Greek form of the Hebrew name Joshua. And every Jew would have known that Joshua's name meant, they would have known. Joshua in the Old Testament was first born into slavery it was a name that conveyed hope, but was not the reality. It was just symbolic, because Joshua meant salvation. But the Jews were slaves and had not been delivered out of captivity yet. They had not yet been saved. But Joshua was not called Joshua was not called Joshua at his birth. This I didn't really know. His birth name was Hoshea. And he followed Moses out of Egypt. And he was one of the spies that was sent into Canaan, uh, into the, the promised land. And, but before he did that, before they left, Moses changed Hoshea's name. Moses took two words, Jehovah, or Yahweh, and Hoshea, and wove them together to make a brand new name. Joshua, meaning the Lord is salvation, or God saves. When the angel told Joseph 
and Mary, the boy's name, the name would be Jesus, they would have had a clear, immediate, deep, rich understanding of the name of Jesus. They would have immediately understood that Jesus was derived from Joshua and that Jesus means the Lord of salvation or uh, God saves. And they would have remembered that Joshua was used by God to save his people, the people of Israel, from a life of futility and death in the wilderness. And then Joshua brought them into the land of the living, a, a place to thrive called the promised land. And the Israelites would become a light to the world, a vine planted by God, destined to bring other nations to God. When the angel announced to, jo to Joseph, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Uh, the angel was clearly communicating God was on the move, fulfilling promises, finally sending Jesus, the one who will bring complete salvation to God's people. Because this time the one, this Jesus, was not wearing the name symbolically. Jesus, the Lord of salvation, is actually the Lord of salvation in the flesh. Jesus came to lead God's people out of a life of futility and death into the land of the living. Have you ever wondered why uh, our Heavenly Father sent the Son into such a hostile world? What was the problem that warranted such an intervention? Was the problem ignorance? People didn't understand who God was or what God expected? If so, then Jesus could have just been a teacher and nothing more. Was the problem our brokenness? If that was the case, Jesus could have come as a counselor or healer and nothing more. Was our problem poverty? If that was it, Jesus could have come simply as a prophet, crying out for economic justice. No, the problem went much deeper. The angel explained it when he said to Joseph, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. God knows we need more than a, just a teacher or just a healer or a counselor or more than just a prophet. Humanity needs a savior. So God sent Jesus, the one who could save us from our sins. And that truly is good news for us. It is good news that God loves you and he loves me and God wants a relationship with us and a relationship with you. It is good news that no matter what you've done or what I've done, no matter what we think we've done, God is not against us, but for us. No matter how far or how often we have wandered away from God. Jesus said, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Here's the reality. We all push God out of our lives. We all live for ourselves and build our little kingdoms with our little plans and our little projects. The Bible calls the rejection of God, the neglecting of God and his kingdom, the lack of loving our neighbor as ourselves. He calls that sin. Now, sin is not a word that's very popular anymore. We don't use it much, not even in church. But deep down, I think we see the problem inside of us if we're reflective, if we're humble. And though we might, might not say it out loud, we are very grateful that God has provided a way for our sins to be forgiven. Jesus came to save us from sin and death. 
that we might experience the source of all life, a life abundant, a life full of grace, and to be able to walk with God. That we might become the people of God and reflect God's love and light into a hurting and dark world. Will you come and experience the richness of his name this season? Will you take time to kneel before his manger this Christmas, allowing him to take up his rightful place in your heart and in your life? See, Christ has come, and Christ is coming, and he will come again. Christ is coming. Christ is coming again this Christmas more fully into our hearts, more fully into our lives if we are willing, if we are open. Therefore, let us experience the majesty of this name, this name that was registered in heaven, delivered and announced by an angel, and given to a newborn son, a son perfectly suited to be our Savior. Let us close in prayer. Jesus, your name, God's salvation, is a beautiful and special name that no one else could carry. You are the Lord of salvation and our God who saves. I am so grateful. We are so grateful that you entered this hostile world to save us. God, thank you for saving me. You are so much more than a healer or just a teacher. You are so much more than just a counselor or a prophet. You are our savior. You are all these things, and you saved us from our sins. What good news. What good news to receive. May the wonder of your name fill our hearts with joy this Christmas and always. For in the precious name of Jesus, we pray this. Amen. We have a couple of announcements this Sunday. First, guess who won? the ugly Christmas sweater contest. And just like my mom used to say, I'll give you three guesses, but the first two don't count. That's right. I won the ugly Christmas sweater contest. And I know you love my hat, but you're gonna have to get your own. And our second announcement for this morning is that we will be having a Christmas Eve service, just to remind everyone, on Thursday, the 24th, Christmas Eve, at 5.30, the Virgus Church is hosting a drive-in Christmas Eve service. And we will be doing some carols, we'll be hearing the Christmas story, and for sure we will be concluding with singing Silent Night by Candlelight. Looking forward to it. From our family to yours, have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Hi, this is Carl with the Norwegian Blessing. May the ruts always fit the wheels on your pickup. May your earmuffs always keep out that north wind. May the sun shine warm on your lefse. May the rain fall soft on your lutefisk. And until we meet again, may the good Lord protect us from any and all unnecessary uftas. Yeah, sure you betcha. Amen. And now, dear friends, receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen and amen. <laughs>